Well, today we're going to continue to focus on some of the great heroes of the faith. Today we're looking at uh, a woman of the word, and uh, one of many women of the word. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the idea of peace. Peace is an important concept. Peace is something that universally is valued by people. I found it as a great way to begin conversations with people about uh, our faith, uh, is to talk to them about, you know, they're interested in peace. Well, you know, oh, yeah, that would be great. You know, I, I found that the only true peace that's going to happen is as people are changed from the inside out. Well, how does that happen? And that leads into a great way to share our faith and talk about Christ. Who doesn't want peace, right? I mean, I find it interesting that our, our Savior is referred to as the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Right? John Lennon uh, sang the song, Give Peace a Chance. And everybody from the hippies of the 1960s to the grannies of today, which turns out are the same exact people. Um, <laughs> but everybody uh, would love to see all people around the world be at peace. Uh, here in uh, our town, we find ourselves far removed from any uh, front lines of any war. Uh, yes, our country is, is fighting a war on drugs, a war on terrorism, and currently there's a war going on between Russia and Ukraine. But you and I probably won't be shot at anytime recently. We won't have to pick up a weapon anytime soon. But even so, are we really at peace? Are we, the people in this community, at peace? Do you find peace? Do I find peace? Our battles are often more civilized, if you will, or maybe they're just more subtle. Uh, too often, we're involved with a bat in a battle of a different kind than a military battle, but it still seems to steal our peace, doesn't it? We find ourselves in conflict over any number of things with all kinds of different people. At work, we might fight over our territories. You know, this is my area. Stay out, you know, stay in your own lane. Uh, at home, we hurt and are hurt by words. Um, at church and churches around the country, uh, we, we engage in something that uh, the 20 and 21st century churches refer to as the worship wars, which is, you know, a very strange thing for churches to, uh, to involve themselves in. We overreact, we divide ourselves, we draw lines, we pick sides, we dig in, and we fight over things. If you're not currently experiencing one of these uh, examples and can't relate, uh, you've probably experienced them in the past. Or you know someone who is currently experiencing them. Or you will experience them sometime shortly in the future. It's pretty much a universal uh, experience for us that we, we get involved in situations that rob our peace. I'll bet you uh, we all know people who are not speaking to one another, who have nothing good to say about this other person, uh, or who are nursing some deep wounds because of a, a fight in, uh, in the past. It's easy to find ourselves at war with one another. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where, you know, you've done everything right, you've treated this other person well, but things just have turned against you? Uh, or you've uh, treated somebody very well, and then the hour that you needed them, you were counting on them, they bailed on you and nowhere, nowhere to be found. It's, it's real easy to get in that situation and want justice. Be filled with sort of a, a righteous, uh, uh, self-righteous anger. Uh, I found myself in a situation like that uh, not too many years ago where I, I worked with a guy and I had always treated him well. Um, he was a, a donor to our ministry, and I had always kind of gone out of my way to use his uh, funds wisely, uh, almost to a fault. I was good to this guy and above reproach. 
then a day came where we entered into an agreement together, he and I, that was going to be helpful to both of us in ministry. It involved us working together over a three-year period. First year went great. Uh, and then the second year, I had to approach him about his commitment uh, because some things had happened that were unforeseen, and I really needed him to come through. And when I really needed him the most, after all I had done and how well I had treated him, honestly, he decided to not hold up his end of the bargain. And it really put me in a bad place. It really messed up my life. It, it ended up pretty much derailing that ministry. Um, and, you know, my life was thrown into a, into a um, you know, frenzy because of the, his decision. Uh, and I was mad. I'll tell you, I was very angry and I wanted justice to happen. But in the course of that time, as the Lord often does, he spoke to me through his word. And I learned a few things about dealing with anger and being wronged from a woman in the Old Testament who we're going to look at today, whose name is Abigail. Um, have you ever heard of Abigail? Any, any hands out there? A few, a couple of hands. She's a pretty minor character in the Old Testament, uh, but she handles herself so wisely that I think that we can learn a thing or two from Abigail. We find her story in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 25, and by chapter 26, the story's over, and we, we don't hear of her um, much after that. Here's sort of a, a brief retelling, maybe not so brief, but a brief, my attempt at a brief retelling of her story. I think it would make a great movie. You tell me what you think. So Abigail and Nabal, her husband, uh, live in Maon which is located in the hills south of Judea. Uh, Nabal owns 3,000 sheep, which he shears near a place called Carmel. David, who later becomes King David, but that's the David we're talking about here. He's not king yet. But David supported Nabal by supplying security for him to keep marauding tribes from stealing his sheep. Uh, as a result, Nabal was prospering. And one day, David uh, was in the wilderness near Carmel with his men, and he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep nearby. Well, David and his men needed some food and water. They were, they were really at the end of themselves and needed some supplies. And so he sent an emissary to go ask Nabal, hey, could you give us some food and water? We're really hurting over here. But Nabal sends back his answer, and that answer is no. When uh, the men return to David and tell him that Nabal has said no, David completely overreacts and says, let's take 400 armed men with swords, and we're going to march to Nabal's house, and we're going to slice off some heads. Um, a, meanwhile, kind of a sub-story, a servant hears what David is planning, and he goes to uh, Abigail, uh, Nabal's wife, and tells her about David's plan. Not only was Abigail beautiful, she was also resourceful, capable, diplomatic, and wise. Abigail quickly considers the options, puts together a plan, and implements a course of action. She puts together an unbelievable quantity of wine and food, for a feast for David and his men. Loads it all on donkeys, she climbs on a donkey herself, and heads to the hills to meet David. She did not consult Nabal about whether she should do that or not, um, and did not ask his permission. Well, when Abigail meets David, she throws herself on the ground before him in an in a act of great humility and respect. She offers the food and drink, pleads with him to forgive Nabal. She asked David to put the blame of Nabal's iniquity on her, arguing that killing her foolish husband would not be prudent. And in the end, David is won over by her logic and uh, grants her request. Thus, Abigail saved her husband from the wrath of David's sword. Abigail went, then uh, goes back to Nabal, her husband, and talks with him, but he's holding a feast of his own. 
And he's quite drunk at that time. So she waited until the next morning to speak to him about what she had done. And when Abel, uh, when Abigail tells Nabal what had happened, the scripture says uh, in chapter 25, verses 37 through 38, it says, His heart died within him, and he became as stone. And about ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. Uh, during the course of all this, David must have noticed that Abigail was not only smart, but also quite beautiful. So after Nabal died, David sent his servants to Abigail and asked her to become his wife. Abigail wisely accepts the offer and takes five of her attendants to David's house and is married to him. So that's sort of the story. A little background here. The name Nabal, Abigail's husband, first husband, uh, that name means fool. And he certainly lives up to his name. Uh, in that part of the world, and even today, it is not considered outrageous to expect some kind of help for the service that David had given to Nabal, protecting him from these marauding tribes. Um, it's possible, kind of playing devil's advocate a little bit for Nabal here, it's possible that Nabal was putting all his eggs in the Saul basket. Saul was the king at that time, and he didn't want to, maybe, maybe he didn't want to be seen as a David sympathizer, you know, didn't want to cross Saul. Uh, but you would think he could at least help David out with something. Um, Abigail uses her words, uh, we'll look at that a, a little bit later, but she uses lots of words to uh, communicate to David. This is, um, generally speaking, a female strength. And she praises David and encourages him and flatters him. She expresses the hope that he will live a long life and that David's enemies will as foolish as Nabal. And if you read this chapter, which we'll read some of it later on, you see she really lays it on thick with David. Well, what can we learn from Abigail? Uh, first of all, this isn't a how-to uh, section. You know, this is, doesn't necessarily say, you know, well, David, since uh, Abigail didn't tell her husband what she's doing, wives, you don't ever have to tell your husband what you're up to, just go do it. No, that's not the, the takeaway. Uh, it's also not the takeaway that, hey, the way to get to a man's heart is through his stomach. You know, that's kind of what Abigail does with, uh, with David. And uh, a lot of truth to that, but that's not necessarily the takeaway for today. Uh, three things I think we can, can learn from, from Abigail. First is that uh, at times, peace may be more important than being right. Having peace may be more important than being right. Abigail strikes me as a wise peacemaker. Uh, you're probably familiar with the New Testament. Uh, Romans 12, 18 says, If possible, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Peace is important and it's kind of placed in your lap as, as much as possible. Abigail is really living this out. She's she is, as much as it's possible, whatever she can do to bring peace to the situation, she's doing it. Uh, an argument could be made that Nabal was within his right to deny David his request. I mean, after all, it was a request. Would you, would you help us? It wasn't like they had a contract and he, you know, was obligated to do this. Abigail could have said, hey, I'm sticking with my man. He made the decision and far be it for me to go around him. But she understood that sometimes you can be right, but you're just pulling coals down on your own head by demanding to be right. Sometimes peace is more important. As the great theologian Dr. Phil has said, you can either be right all the time or you can have a happy marriage, right? <laughs> One of the two. How many spouses have seen this to be true? Yeah, you can initiate World War III and prove that you are right, but if you can just swallow your pride, let it go, offer an olive branch, oh my, things just seem to go a lot smoother. Right? Can I get an amen from somebody out there? <laughs> hey, I heard a murmur of an amen. Okay. Um, 
second thing we can learn from Abigail. So the first thing is that sometimes peace is more important than being absolutely right. Secondly, I think uh, we can see that uh, we see her keep her head and not escalate this problem. You know, Nab Nabal makes a foolish move. David has provided cover for him. He, he decides not to, to help him in any way. But David overreacts. You know, his, his thing is, let's go in, we're going to kill them all. Well, he orders some food. Apparently you have the strength to kill everyone, so, you know, you must not be dying that, you know, that much from food. But a Abigail doesn't get caught up in this. He said, he said, battle and escalate this. Um, at one point she reminds David that one day he will be king. And does he really want the guilt of blood shed on the, the guilt of this blood that he's going to shed on his conscience when he is the king. I think we can often get a lot further with people when we remind them what, of what they actually want. You know, hearkening back to Dave's comments, you know, what's really important. Uh, I spoke a couple years back to a men's group in Minnesota, and um, I really wanted to to get, get the point across to them that um, we need to take steps of faith as, as men. We need to continue to take steps of faith, uh, step out and do things uh, for God. And uh, rather than just kind of hit them over the head with that, I appeal to something that I know they want. You know, most Christian men and women want one day when they get to heaven, they want to hear God say to them, well done, good and faithful servant, right? And so that's where I started, was to say, man, you want to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah, I do. Well, do you think he's going to say that to you if you never trusted him, you never took a step of faith, you never stepped out and felt like he was leading you into something? You just played it safe the whole time? I don't know. And so oftentimes, rather than just beating someone over the head, and kind of escalating the problem, because then people start to put up their defenses. It, it works, and this is what Abigail does, to uh, appeal to something that they, you know they want. David doesn't want this uh, guilt on his, on his head. So yet another insight that I think we can pick up from Abigail in this story is the idea that um, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15, verse 1. Boy, does she ever make use of this principle. Listen to what she says to David. Pardon your servant, my lord. She's really, you know, a gentle answer turns away wrath, right? So David's coming to kill everybody in Nabal's house and listen to the gentle answer that she gives. Pardon your servant, my lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has. Please pay no attention to my lord, her husband, the wicked man, Nabal. And now, my lord, as surely as the lord your God lives and you live, since the lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my lord, in other words, you, David, be like Nabal. May they all be foolish people. And let this gift that I'm bringing you uh, which your servant, again, she's humble, um, has brought to you, be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord, for you, David, because you fight the Lord's battles, and no wrongdoing can be found in you. She know who David is? You know, she probably hasn't read much of the Old Testament. Uh, no, no, uh, wrongdoing can be found in you. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in a bundle of the living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies will be hurled away uh, as from the pocket of a slain. When the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing, I want every good thing for you that God has promised you concerning him, his appoint, has appointed a new ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed from having avenged himself. 
And when the Lord your God has brought my servant success, remember your servant. Remember. You know, she is really laying it on with him. You know, um, just think how much further we would get with people if we used some of her uh, style, if we learned from her example. I mean, married men out there, okay? Married men. If your wife ever came to you and said, my Lord, pardon your most humble wife for interrupting. <laughs> and may your Lord, may the Lord your God bless you with every blessing. But I ask only this one request, that even as the Lord will take out and trash all those who set themselves against you, that you too would find it in your heart to take out the trash. <laughs>
cause the problem to get even worse as we are tempted to so often. Lord, I just uh, thank you for your word. It's a constant reminder to us that we, we serve the Prince of Peace. And Lord, may we be known as peacemakers. Lord, I ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen.